Hi, I'm Mark Barsamian. In this video, I'll be discussing a new kind of collection called a multiset. This material is from section 9.6 of the book, which is entitled Are Combinations with Repetition Allowed? The corresponding homework is this collection of exercises from section 9.6. Our topics will be th these six in this video. Counting collections where repetition is allowed, then the definition of multiset, and then counting the number of multisets, and then we'll discuss counting iterations of a loop, and counting triples of a certain type, and counting R tuples of a certain type. We'll use the concept of combinations from section 9.5. Recall that an R combination of a set of n elements is an unordered selection of r elements taken from that set of n elements. In other words, it's just simply a subset containing r elements. And in section 9.5, we learned that the number of r combinations of a set of n elements is denoted by this symbol or this symbol. This is spoken n choose r or n take r. And both of these are spoken the same way. So this is also spoken n choose r. And we learn the formula for that number. The number of r combinations of a set of n elements is this. n factorial over the quantity r factorial times the quantity n minus r factorial. Now remember that our first topics are counting collections where repetition is allowed and the definition of multiset. We will get to those topics in this example. Example 1 is similar to 9.6 number 18. A large can of coins consists of pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters. Coins of a particular denomination are indistinguishable from one another. Question A. Suppose the collection contains at least 20 coins of each type. The question is, how many different collections of 20 coins can be chosen? Now think about this collection. In this collection of 20 coins, we could have, say, uh, 5 pennies, 3 nickels, and 12 dimes, and no quarters. So in other words, uh, we could have um, more than one penny. So th that's the idea of repetition. We're going to have a collection where you can have more than one coin of a particular type. So that's uh, the idea, again, of a collection where some kind of repetition is allowed. So we're going to think now about how to answer this question. How many different collections of 20 coins can be chosen? In order to solve this problem, it's helpful to introduce some notation and to discuss various ways of notating collections of coins. To start with, let's introduce letters to denote the types of coins. We'll let P denote penny. We'll let K denote nickel. We'll let D denote dime. And we'll let Q denote quarter. And let X be the set of all coin types. So that is, X is this set, the set containing P, K, D, and Q. Let little n be the number of elements in set x. So n is 4. And let r be the number of coins in the collection that we're going to choose. So r is equal to 20. So with these letters, uh, we could write down one such collection. It would be these 20 coins. 6 pennies, 9 nickels, 3 dimes, 2 quarters. That's an example of such a collection. Notice again the repetition. There's a whole bunch of P's in that list. There's a whole bunch of K's in that list. The terminology of multiset applies to this kind of collection. The definition of multiset is this. Uh, the words are a multiset of size R chosen from a set X. Another uh, name for this is an R combination with repetition allowed chosen from a set X. I don't actually like that uh, second alternate wording. The book uses that terminology, R combination, with repetition allowed. I prefer the terminology of multiset, but you do need to know both, especially if you're going to read our book. OK, so what do those words mean? What is a multiset of size R chosen from a set X? Well, what it means is this, an unordered selection of R elements 
taken from the set X with repetition allowed. And here's a symbol for it. Square bracket, a bunch of X's with subscripts. Subscripts starting with 1 and going all the way up to R. So that's a list of, of R things. Those are the R elements. Each one of those elements is taken from the set capital X. And some of the, the elements denoted X subscript K may equal one another. So that's the idea of repetition allowed. With this notation, the collection of 20 coins from the previous page would be denoted this way. Put square brackets around all those letters. Notice, that's a list of 20 symbols, and um, they're taken from a set X that only has four elements. Now, with this terminology, we can articulate the question that we've been asked. Remember our, our question. How many different collections of 20 coins can be chosen? Well, that question now becomes, how many multisets of size R equals 20 can be chosen from a set X that has N equals 4 elements? That's the question that we're going to now seek to answer. We have to figure out a way to count the number of such multisets. It turns out that if we use a simpler method of displaying a particular collection, then the counting will be quite easy. We'll work our way to a simple way of presenting collections in the next few pages. It'll take us a few pages. So first, suppose that there are 20 boxes to be filled with letters chosen from this set, X, which is the set containing P, K, D, and Q. Then the sample collection that we discussed above would be displayed as a table like this. Note the number 20 is the value of R. In general, the number of boxes needed to display a multiset like this would be the number R, the number of cells, the number of columns in that table. Now, instead, imagine that there are vertical bars put in to separate the different types of letters, P, K, D, and Q, and then simple X symbols to denote the letters filling the blanks. So then the sample collection uh, that I presented above would be displayed this way. Notice that there are six X's in that, in that uh, bunch of cells. That's the six P's that are in our collection. And notice that there are nine X's in that block of cells. That represents the nine K's in our collection. There are three X's in that block of cells. That represents the three D's. And there are two X's in this block of cells. That represents the two Q's in that collection. So note that, of course, three more boxes are needed to make room for the three vertical bars that are used to separate the different kinds of letters. Now, where'd that three come from? Well, that number three is four minus one. There are four different kinds of letters. We need three bars to separate those four different kinds of letters. So in general, in a multiset, the number of vertical bars needed to separate the different kinds of elements uh, drawn from a set X with N elements, that number of vertical bars would be N minus 1. The total number of boxes in that row of boxes is now 23. 23 cells across that table. And think about where that number came from. That number 23 is 20 plus 3. It's 20 plus parentheses 4 minus 1. In other words, it's our R plus N minus 1. The number R was 20. The number N was 4. So in general, the total number of boxes needed to display a multiset in this way would be this. The number of boxes would be R plus N minus 1. Of course, the row of numbers across the bottom that row is not really necessary. Uh, the collection above could be displayed more concisely this way. We could just count that there are six X's there. There are nine X's here. There are three X's here. And there are two X's here. And in fact, we could leave out the X symbols altogether and just show the vertical bars in their cells. There are six empty cells here. There are nine empty cells here. 
three empty cells here and two empty cells here. Of course, once you start getting rid of symbols, you, you have to realize that you're going to kind of lose your audience. This presentation of a multiset is very clear. Anybody who hasn't been reading these notes or listening to this video could look at that collection and uh, understand what collection of coins it represents. Whereas this presentation is so concise, it's kind of a private way of abbreviating the collection. All the information's there, but you really have to know how to decode this. But that's okay, we're just going to use this notation to arrive at a, a formula. Now, if the vertical bars are placed in adjacent cells, that would indicate that certain elements of the set X are not included in the collection. For instance, this table with this adjacent pair of vertical bars, or written more concisely, this table, it would represent this collection of coins. Six pennies indicated by that collection of, of empty cells. 12 nickels indicated by that collection of empty cells. No dimes because there are no empty cells between those two eyes. But two quarters indicated by these two empty cells. And the vertical bars can appear at the end of the row of boxes. So for instance, this table, or more concisely without the X's, this table would indicate the following collection. Six pennies, as indicated by those six empty cells, and 14 nickels, as, it, as indicated by those 14 empty cells. And notice, no dimes, because there are no empty cells between those two vertical bars, and no quarters, because there are no empty cells to the right of that last vertical bar. On this page, there's a typo. This set should be denoted X. So we see that every choice of three of 23 cells for the vertical bars to go in corresponds to a particular multi-set of 20 coins chosen from that set X of four letters. So that is every choice of a subset of three cells chosen from the set of 23 cells corresponds to a particular multi-set of the type we're interested in. Now remember that a subset of three chosen from a set of 23 is also called a three combination chosen from that set. So what we've just arrived at is this, and I see there's a typo in this sentence. The number of multisets will be the number of three combinations of a set of 23 elements. So that's this symbol, 23 choose three. This number is easy to compute. Now remember that this kind of expression, 23 factorial over 20 factorial, has the effect of giving you kind of a truncated factorial. So this product is, is the number 1771. So we found the answer to question A. That is, the number of different collections of 20 coins that can be chosen is 1771. Let's go on. Now we can generalize the counting technique. Uh, here's our goal. Our goal now is to count the number of multisets of size R that can be selected from a set X of N elements. So we'll go through the same process of sort of visualizing displaying a multiset in a table. So imagine an empty row of cells in a table. There will need to be R cells to hold the elements chosen to be in the multiset. And there will need to be n minus 1 cells to hold the vertical bars, I, that separate the various types of elements in the multiset. So the table will need R plus n minus 1 cells. And a subset of n minus 1 cells must be chosen to hold the vertical bars. So if I count these shaded cells, there are n minus one of those cells that are shaded. So the number of multisets 
will be the number of subsets of n minus 1 cells, those shaded gray ones, chosen from the row of r plus n minus 1 cells. In other words, the number of multisets will be the number of n minus 1 combinations chosen from a set of r plus n minus 1 elements. That's denoted this way. r plus n minus 1 choose n minus 1, or the notation that I actually prefer, this. C parentheses r plus n minus 1, comma, n minus 1. Now compare this result to the result that um, is presented in this theorem in the book. Theorem 9.6.1 says the number of R combinations with repetition allowed, uh, or multisets of size R, that can be selected from a, a set of N elements is this. R plus N minus 1 choose R. Our formula has r plus n minus 1 choose n minus 1. What's up with that? Why does their formula look different from our formula? Well, in fact, the two formulas are the same. We can see that if we write the factorial expressions that correspond to the two formulas. So the formula that we reached, this one, the factorial expression that that represents is this. And that simplifies to this. The formula presented in the book's theorem, this one, represents this factorial expression. And that simplifies to this. Notice that these are the same. Because those two formulas are the same, and because there is potential confusion, I think it's worthwhile to give a more complete presentation of that theorem 9.6.1. So here's my sort of re-presentation of that theorem. Uh, I'm going to call it theorem 9.6.1. The number of multisets of size r, again, I'm not going to call them r combinations with, with repetition allowed. I'm just going to stick to the term multisets. But you see that it, it's the same as, as that. The number of multisets of size r that can be chosen from a set of n elements is this formula that we came up with, which equals this factorial expression, which equals this formula that the book presents in their theorem. Let's go on, finally, to another question. Suppose the collection contains at least 20 coins of each type. Again, how many different collections of 20 coins can be chosen that contain at least 15 pennies? Well, how do we count that? Well, the idea is this. If your collection has to have at least 15 pennies in it, and, uh, and your collection is going to be 20 coins overall, then you might as well just start by drawing out 15 pennies and putting them in the collection. So then all you have to do is find the remaining five coins. So you are uh, really choosing a collection of the remaining five coins. So once you take out the 15 pennies that have to go into the collection, you have remaining the task of choosing a multi-set of five coins for the rest of the collection. Let's think about the number of ways of doing this. We have r, which is the size of our multi-set. We have little n equals 4. That's the number of types of coins. So the number of multisets will be obtained using that formula. We see that the number of different collections of 20 coins is 56. That's the number of multisets of size 5. But uh, that means we, you know, we would take that multi-set of five coins, add to it the 15 pennies that had already been chosen, and there would be our collection that would have at least 15 pennies. Question C. 
We have a typo. This should say at most 14. So suppose the collection contains at least 20 coins of each type. The question is, how many different collections of 20 coins can be chosen that contain at most 14 pennies? Well, this can be uh, visualized. Let's draw a diagram that shows the set of all collections. And then within that collection, let's show the set of all collections that have uh, more than 14 pennies. So in other words, at least 15 pennies. And then finally, let's show the set of all collections containing at most 14 pennies. Well, that's going to be this green shaded region out here. So from the diagram, we see that the green set containing at most 14 pennies is equal to the blue set of all collections minus the red set. And so therefore, the number of elements in the green set is going to equal the number of elements in the blue set minus the number of elements in the red set. But the number of elements in the blue set, we counted in question A. In question A, we found the number of different collections of 20 coins is 1771. And the number of elements in the red set, the number of collections containing at least 15 pennies, we found in question B. We found the number of collections like that was 56. And so, the number of collections that contain at most 14 pennies, we can uh, get by just simply subtracting. So the number of collections of 20 coins that can be chosen that contain at most 14 pennies is this number, 1715. Let's go on. Question D. Now question D has a typo as well. Suppose the collection contains only 14 pennies, but at least 20 coins of each other type. How many different collections of 20 coins can be chosen? Well, realize that this is the kind of question that is asked in the book. So in the book, you're asked this kind of question. Suppose you're, you're, you have a collection that only contains 14 pennies but has plenty of, of all the other kinds of coins. So the question is, how many different collections of 20 coins can be chosen? Well, the idea is that all you need to do is um, forget about the fact that you're going to run out of pennies if you choose too many. Just think of it this way. Um, just pretend you don't have a limited supply of pennies, but just ask the question, if you have plenty of pennies, how many of those collections of 20 coins could be chosen that contain at most 14 pennies? We found that the number of those collections was 1,715. So there are 1,715 collections of 20 coins that contain at most 14 pennies. Now return to question D. That means that if your can of coins has only 14 pennies in it, then you're okay. All of these 1,715 collections could be achieved using that now limited uh, collection of coins in the can that has only 14 pennies. So in other words, this is just kind of a disguised way of asking the same question that I asked in question C. This question C was, um, suppose you have an unlimited collection, just ask how many different collections of 20 coins can be chosen. So the approach was we found the total number of collections. We found the number of collections that contained at least 15, and then we subtracted.
Let's go on. Question E. Suppose the collection contains only 10 nickels, but at least 20 coins of each other type. So the question is, how many different collections of 20 coins can be chosen? Well, let me draw a diagram for this. So there's a the diagram. We're interested in that green set of collections, the collections with at most 10 nickels. We see that we can count them by counting the set of all collections. Okay, we've done that. That was question A. And subtracting the number of collections with at least 11 nickels. So we need to count the number of collections with at least 11 nickels first. Now remember how we do that. We start by just picking 11 nickels out of uh, the, the can and putting them aside. They're going to be in our collection. So we begin the collection by putting 11 nickels in it. And then we have to choose the remaining nine coins. So we need to choose a multi-set of nine coins. So that number nine is our, is our R. And we're choosing them from this set, uh, capital X, which has n equals 4 elements. All right, so the number of ways of doing that is So we see that the number of multisets that have at least 11 nickels is 220. That's the number of elements in that red set. Now the set that we're interested in is that green set, so we need to subtract. So the number of collections with at most 10, that's the green set is equal to the number of collections, that's the blue set, minus the number of collections with at least 11. Now remember, the number of collections we found in question A, it was this number 1771. The number of collections with at least 11, we just found, it's 220. So the result is the number of collections with at most 10 is 1551. Question F. This question has a typo. This should say 14. So suppose the collection contains only 14 pennies and 10 nickels, but at least 20 coins of each other type. Question is, how many different collections of 20 coins can be chosen? Well, this question can be illustrated with a diagram as well. Let's draw the entire collection. And then let's uh, show the collections containing at least 15 pennies. Those are ones that we don't want. Now we also don't want collections that have at least 11 nickels. That's too many nickels. Well, notice that that's going to be a, a set that's disjoint from the set that I just drew. Because you see that there's no way that a collection of 20 coins can contain both at least 15 pennies and at least 11 nickels. That would be a collection that would have at least 26 coins in it. And our collections have only 20 coins. Now the set of collections that we're interested in is this green set. So we want to count the number of good collections. We just simply subtract the number of bad collections from the set of all collections.
Well, those numbers are numbers that we've already found. The number of good collections, remember, is 1771. The number of collections with uh, at least 15 pennies was 56. The number of collections with at least 11 nickels was uh, this number, 220. So we get the, the number that we're interested in by subtracting 1771 minus 56 minus 220, and we end up with this number. That's the total number of good collections. And that's the end of that very long example. Example 2 is similar to 9.6 number 9. In this example, we'll be counting iterations of a loop. Consider this algorithm segment. In this algorithm segment, k is an index that can go from 1 to 10. j is an index that can only go from k to 10. And i is an index that can only go from j to 10. Now, uh, for each of those triples, i, j, k, the statements in the body of the inner loop get, uh, get iterated. The question is, how many times will the innermost loop be iterated when the algorithm segment is run? Well, the key to this problem is to realize that the inner loop will be iterated once for each triple of numbers i, j, k that have this property. k can be between 1 and 10, remember. Now, j can only be from k to 10, so that means that j has to be greater than or equal to k. So j is greater than or equal to k. i can only go from j to 10, so that means that i has to be greater than or equal to j. So we see that i is greater than or equal to j, and, uh, and 10 is greater than or equal to i. So we get this string of inequalities that that triple of numbers must satisfy. Examples of triples like that are, are these triples here. i is 6, j is 5, and k is 3. Those three numbers satisfy this inequality. Now, there's nothing that says the numbers have to be distinct. So for instance, um, i could be 9, j could be 1, k could also be 1, and so forth. So our question has become this. How many triples i, j, k are there such that, oops, this should be, that should be down here. So the question is, how many triples are there such that that inequality is true? Now, it turns out that if we use a visual method of displaying a particular triple, then the counting is quite simple. We'll work our way to a simple way of presenting, this should say, presenting triples in the next few pages. So consider 10 cells holding the integers from 1 to 10. So 10 cells like that. Now consider those 10 cells being separated by 9 cells holding the letter i to signify dividers separating the integers from 1 to 10. So in between each of those 10 integers, we have one of these little dividers, these i's. Now imagine those white cells being empty, but there are still the spots where the integers from 1 to 10 would go. So we have these dividers still, and in between these dividers are these spots where, for instance, the number 4 would go. Now consider inserting letters into those empty white cells to indicate the value of a variable. So, for instance, this table 
with a k here between those two dividers indicates that k equals 8 because that's the spot where the number 8 would go. And this table with a k way over here on the left, that's the far left cell, that's telling us that k equals 1 because that's the cell where the number 1 would go. And we can insert three letters into the empty white cells to indicate the value of a triple. So for example, this table represents the triple IJK equals 852. Now to see why, clearly the I is sitting in the spot where the 8 would go. So I is 8. And the J is sitting in the spot where the 5 would go. So J is clearly 5. And the K is sitting in the spot where the 2 would go. So that tells us K is 2. This table down here represents the triple IJK equals 10, 2, 2. The I is sitting way over here in the 10 spot. That tells us that I is 10. The J is sitting between these first two dividers. That tells us that J is 2. The K is also sitting between those first two dividers. So that tells us that K is 2 as well. Now realize that because the integers i, j, k have to satisfy this inequality, we don't really need the letters themselves. We can just use a placeholder like the symbol x. So for example, this table, uh, the, the x that's farthest to the right has to be the i because the i has to be the greatest number. So this table tells us that i is equal to 8. And then in this table, the middle symbol, the middle x, is here. That's in the 5 spot. Well, the middle size letter has to be the j. So that tells us that j is equal to 5. And the, the, the letter that's the farthest to the left is this x that's way over here. That's in the 2 spot. Well, the smallest letter is the k. That tells us that the k is the number 2. What about this table? This table has three numbers in it. It has an x way over here in the 10 spot, and then it has two x's way over here in the 2 spot. So the largest number is 10, and the two smaller numbers are 2 and 2. Well, the largest number has to be the i, and the other two numbers have to be the j and the k. So this table represents the triple i, j, k. Now, realize that we don't really need to show all those empty white cells. We don't need to show all of these cells that are empty. We really only need to show the positions of the 3x symbols in relation to the 9i symbols. So for example, this table has uh, an x uh, in between the seventh and eighth divider. That's the eight position. And it has an x between the uh, fourth and fifth divider. That's the five position. And it has an x between the first and second divider. That's the two position. Well, the greatest of those numbers has to be the i, the middle one has to be the j, and the smallest has to be the k. So this very concise presentation of i's and x's in a row denotes that triple, i, j, k equals 8, 5, 2. Now what about this table? This table has an x way over here on the far right beyond the ninth divider. That's the 10 spot. And it has two x's between the first and second divider. That's the spot that's the 2 spot. So that means this triple is going to have one number that's 10 and two numbers that are the number 2. Well, the biggest number has got to be the i, so that means this triple has to be 10, 2, 2. So we see that the table representing a triple i, j, k will always have 
12 cells. Three cells to hold X symbols and nine cells to hold I symbols. And we see that every choice of three of the 12 cells for the X's to go in will correspond to a particular triple of integers, I, J, K, that satisfy this inequality. That is every choice of a subset of three cells chosen from the set of 12 cells, every subset like that corresponds to a particular triple, I, J, K, that satisfies that inequality. So the number of triples will be the number of those subsets, that is the number of three combinations of a set of 10 elements. That's denoted by this symbol, 10 choose three. That number is easy to compute. So that number is 120. So that's the answer to our original question. The number of times the inner loop will be iterated is equal to the number of triples of integers i, j, k that satisfy this inequality. And that number is 120. Let's go on. Now we can generalize this result to counting r tuples of a certain type. Here's our goal. Count the number of r tuples of integers, which would be denoted this way, m subscript 1, comma m subscript 2, all the way up to m subscript r, such that this inequality is true. n is greater than or equal to m1, which is greater than or equal to m2, all the way down to mr, which is greater than or equal to 1. So that's our goal. Now we'll do the same thing we did in the um, more concrete example that we just did. We'll imagine how to display that kind of uh, R-tuple. So we'll imagine an empty row of cells in a table. They're going to need to be R cells to hold the X symbols that denote those integers. And they're going to be going to need to be N minus 1 cells to hold the vertical bars that separate the spots representing the possible integer values from 1 to n. So the table is going to need this many cells, r plus n minus 1. Now a subset of n minus 1 cells must be chosen to hold the vertical bars. So that would look like this. Now there's a typo here. This should say the number of r tuples will be the number of subsets of n minus 1 cells chosen from the row of r plus n minus 1 cells. In other words, the number of, again, this should say r tuples, will be the number of n minus 1 combinations chosen from the set of r plus n minus 1 elements. In other words, this number, again, that's the same formula that we came up with in the previous examples when talking about counting multisets. Another way of thinking of this would be choosing a subset of R cells to hold the X symbols. So we're going to choose those blue cells that are going to hold the X's. So the number of, this should say R tuples, would be the number of subsets of R cells chosen from the row of R plus N minus 1 cells. In other words, the number of R tuples will just be the number of R combinations chosen from a set of R plus N minus 1 elements. So this number. Well, these two approaches, that one and this one, yield the same result. So th these two expressions, that we got in those two approaches actually represent the same factorial expression. So our result is this theorem about the number of, of certain types of R-tuples. So the number of R-tuples of integers, denoted this way, that satisfy this inequality is given by this formula. That's the end of our discussion of uh,
counting certain kinds of R-tuples, and that's the end of this video. Thank you.